Pete, thanks for doing this. Eric, pleasure. Man, this means a lot to Absolutely, me. Absolutely, man. You, have, you just don't understand. I, it would take me an hour to explain it to you, but it really means a lot to me. Ah, my pleasure, man. Um, lots of stuff. I, I, this is a conversation, my friend. It's not an interview, but I, I definitely am interested in your history of music. Um, I've spent a lot of time watching uh, the sessions on QED mm-hmm. and um, the extended one that I watched a couple of days ago had you playing a harmony guitar. And I think it wasn't yours, but you might re- you might have been using it at the time and within that session. And you made the comment that you had a K, yeah, a K guitar, and then you had hold on, I got it here. And you had you said you had a Stella acoustic. That was my f- my first one. Yeah, Stella acoustic. Yeah, from the Spiegel catalog. <laughs> no, the, the, K, the K was actually uh, Spiegel catalog. I saw that you know at the time you couldn't afford a Gibson or a Gretsch, you know, at that time, so. I eyeballed this K, which I wish I had now because apparently, uh, oh, worth some money. It was 159 bucks. <laughs> and the, you know, the running joke I always say is, my mom, I, I talked to her and I said it's seven bucks a month. And my mother, God love her. Uh-huh. She, it's like she uh, she came to a show that I played. She passed away in uh, '09. Okay. But we were we were playing somewhere, and uh, I mean, I alluded to my mom being there and how. Great! It made me feel that she was there and the whole thing. And she she was like eighty eighty four at the time, whatever. Okay. But I I talked about how I talked her into buying my, that guitar for seven bucks a month month, and she yelled out, "I'm still paying for it." <laughs> <laughs> I wouldn't doubt it, my friend. Yeah. That was the that was the sales hook. Now, in, did I read correctly that you started playing guitar? And got you actually you, you started playing guitar or playing in a band seriously at like 16 is that right yeah it was uh actually like 14 or so when the beatles came out okay um that's when geez every kid changed their hairstyle and what were what did they mean to you not initially but over the i mean are is it a really big impact on you the beatles uh-huh yeah sure yeah because uh i mean the thing that was interesting i have an older brother so i knew um, Little Richard, I knew Chuck Berry, I knew Buddy Holly. The first album I ever bought was Buddy Holly. I still have that. And Peggy Sue was the first single I ever bought. Okay. And um, so I was aware of all those artists, you know, Muddy Waters, and my brother was into Doo Wop and Porky Chedwick, you know, when I was a kid, you know, Porky nine on, listen to, you know. But um, when the Beatles and the Rolling Stones and all those bands came out, um, it's like, oh, my God, they're doing, like, Chuck Berry and Bo Diddley and, you know, because their early records were, like, half original music and half cover tunes, stuff right. they did in clubs wherever they played, you know. But uh, the whole look of everything and, you know, uh, is, you know, people that grew up in that era um, or that year, couple years, when when Kennedy got assassinated, it was like, I was 13, and it was just... Un- unimaginable, you know. Mm-hmm. And I think the whole thing, timing-wise, um, culturally, when the Beatles came out and that whole thing, it took everybody like to something that was took your mind off of it. Okay. You know. Okay. And it was like something new and refreshing, and you know, for teenagers at the time to grab onto. Let me ask you this. Um... In the end, as it as it played out, did you have a favorite over the Stones or the Beatles? Um, I I I can't say I early on I favored the Beatles, you know, um, but I, I dug the Rolling Stones too, and, and every like the Animals, I loved the Animals and uh, the Kinks, you know. I remember certain songs where I was when I heard You Really Got Me, uh-huh. doing a quarter mile across <laughs> McKees Rocks Bridge in a Chevy too. Wow, that record, come on, you know. To like, I'm at a stop sign. I grew up in McKees Rocks. I'm in a stop sign uh, in Norwood, which is part of the McKees Rocks up on the hill, Stowe Township. Right, right. House of the Rising Sun. I know exactly where I was. I pulled up to a stop sign, and it's like the DJ said, here's a new one by a band called The Animals. And it was like, whoa, this is cool. <laughs> so, I mean, you know, The Who, just all those bands, I, I really dug them all, and, you know, at that time. I remember the first time I heard that song, too. Uh, 
and I, by Van Halen, and my mother goes to me, you know, that's not their song. <laughs> <laughs> Mom, this song is so great. Yeah. It's not their song, son. <laughs> yeah, right, right. <laughs> okay, so if I got it correct, then you got a record contract at 16 with Phillips Mercury Records. Is that correct? Right, yeah, and that was, uh, gee, if I can remember. We had... Um, I think it was like a three record deal, but nonetheless, it was huge to get signed by at sixteen. Yeah, record company. Even at that time, yeah. And uh, kind of the letdown was, but it's funny because finding out later on was when we went to New York. It was all studio players. I was the lead singer of the band, so I of course sang the songs. But and uh, it's just actually like not that long ago. It made me feel. Okay, well, nothing wrong with that, really, because the Beach Boys with the Wrecking Crew, you know, mm-hmm. you, you know, all those people that played on everybody's record. It's it. like, well, okay, that was the industry, you know. It was like, so the band was out touring, but for the studio tracks, there was a lot of musicians in and out. Yeah, it, you know, when we walked, I remember when we walked in, we had a song called Airplane, and it was like, uh-huh. it was um, two guitars, bass, and drums, very, you know basic and everything and we went to new york in the studio and it was like man it was like at least 20 musicians or so you know it was like some horns some strings a couple guitar players a percussionist and it was like wow you know they filled the sound then they did yeah Yeah. now the other song was magic book is that correct the magic book magic book yeah i don't it's funny i had a conversation with uh a good friend uh who was talking he brought this uh record in it was called I Don't Know What You're Waiting For, which is kind of, of a ballad thing, that a woman and a guy, write, songwriters from New York, had written. It was a nice song. Okay. So I don't, I don't know if Magic Book was, I think it might have been on the flip side of that or, you know, whatever. Okay. Nonetheless, neither one was a hit. <laughs> <laughs> so what about the song T-Rock? Or was that, is that correct? Yeah, that was... Um, Earlier when we were talking about the, uh, our band won to battle the bands. That was a song that, okay. And it was it was uh, sponsored by Tetley T maybe or Lipton T. <laughs> so of course, oh, really? every band, the uh, criteria was you do a cover tune, an original tune, and you do T-Rock. <laughs> and that was it. <laughs> that was a show. It was a big deal, you know? I would think so. Yeah. Greenwich Village in the late 60s, my friend. Yeah, that was... Uh, didn't spend a long time there, but it had enough to eyeball it. And, you know, and the name of the band you were with was Peter's Pipers. Peter's Pipers, yeah. yeah. We had won the um, uh, the tea tournament at Westview Park at the time and went to the finals in uh, Bucks County. They give you money or a trophy? Uh, <laughs> oh, you know what? I d- you know Jack Hunt. Uh-huh. Down at uh, Jack's Ginchy place. Yep. I actually gave yep. him the statue. It's like, you know, <laughs> you win for <laughs> Little League All Star or, you know. They and I don't, I don't know what the prize was. You know? <laughs> I remember we dedicated, or dedicate, we got, um, gave the money to um, Children's Hospital. Oh, right we on. Won. Yeah. Right on. At the time. So, and it, it wasn't like a lot of money. But uh, the cool thing was we went to the finals and competed against, I don't know, 40 some bands or whatever. Right. And we came in sixth, which wasn't too bad. That's respectable. Yeah. So memories on Greenwich Village. Uh, just um, late sixties. It was, um, you know, every bar, whatever. There was music every every place, and just checking out the clothes, and it was just a. I mean, it was the you know peak of hippiedom, you know. The counterculture. Yeah. I bought my first Nehru shirt or jacket, you know, Greenwich Village and stuff, and it was just like, yeah, it was it was eye opening, man, because you just read about it and you know, uh-huh. to be exposed to it was great, even yeah. though you know it was a short two three days, or whatever. But and you mentioned um, we were chatting a little bit off air. You would uh, mention that Tim Buckley. That was the era of Tim Buck- Buckley was down there. Yeah, um, and then of course he's his son's probably a little more popular, Jeff Buckley, many years later. Right, and it became like a kind of a cult hero with passing unfortunately that's how i found out about tim buckley was through his son oh okay yeah yeah and then at that time it was great um and my business boogie street we named it after leonard cohen who was also a big Mm -hmm. folk singer which i think he i think he originated in the village too roughly in that area yeah 
Yeah, it was all um, Bleecker Street. Yeah. Um, Perry Ave and you know Perry Street. Just that whole section, that whole area was just. Man, it was it was like vibrating, you know. I mean, I really? did more. I was in New York more, uh, like late seventies into the eighties. Okay, and, you know that city always. It's always moving. I would leave Pittsburgh, and when I got to New York, I always either landed at LaGuardia or Newark, whatever, and would take a a bus into Midtown. Okay, I'd get off okay. and it would just be like, <laughs> you could feel you it. You could feel it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Now you also were were telling me that you spent time in the late '60s in San Francisco too. Is that yeah, correct? One, one of the first uh, uh, like road trip gigs we had a four week engagement at a place called Arthur's. Okay, there was one in San Francisco, L.A., Dallas, and New York. And the uh, Sybil Burton, who was Richard Burton's first wife mm-hmm. before Elizabeth Taylor, mm-hmm. um, she was she owned the places. So this one was in Girardelli Square uh, in the cannery, like down on Fisherman's okay. Wharf. Okay. And once again, it was just like, that was 68. And, I mean, it was just How hot. did it differ from Greenwich Village? Or was it about the same? Um, Greenwich Village seemed more bustling and more folky, I guess you could say. You know, when I when I think back of San Francisco, I remember... You know, meeting different guys who come in and hear the band. That, and I remember one guy saying to me, check this band out. And it was Led Zeppelin's first album. And I put that on. I was like, whoa. <laughs> you know. And just, you know. It, Can I ask you a question about that record for a second? Because mm-hmm. I, I always used to make the comment to my friends, you know, man, could you imagine being like 16, 17, 18 years old and getting that Led Zeppelin record, putting it on, and the first – song good times bad times and just hearing that riff that single solitary riff i would imagine would have blown my mind yeah because nothing like sounded like that right, right? communication breakdown yeah. you know that stuff it was just like yeah. well i mean I, you know jeff beck had been around you know and of course yard birds and you know his solo stuff yeah but yeah it was like it was it was really powerful good. yeah so it was the, was the rock edge or the slightly heavier stuff in that era in San Fran different than what was going on in Greenwich Village was was that the difference I would say yeah yeah I remember when we were in the uh, in the um, finals at the T tournament there was a band called Illusion from Long Island man they were they were incredible but they were more uh, kind of R and B but Illusion okay like the Rascals kind of okay. Really, um, all over the stage, your lead singer was like kicking this mic stand down like James Brown that would come back up. And, you know, he's dancing around. They all had uh, afros at the time, which was like, what? You know. And But San Francisco was more, I want to say, laid back in a way. Okay. And, uh, I mean, what we were exposed to was more more rock than, than it was That's in New York. That's interesting. And it's hard to compare because we weren't in – in the late 60s in New York that long to really check out what was going on other than, you know, we want to go down a village and check. You know. So the music might have been harder, but the atmosphere was more laid back. I think so, yeah. As opposed to New Maybe York. Maybe more drugged. <laughs> well, I would think so. You know. So when I think of Greenwich Village from the legends, uh, the legends that have been there and they talk about that era, it seems more folk drive. Is that right? Maybe, New York? Yeah, at that time. Yeah, I think it was coming into, um, I think it was coming out of the folk thing in a way. Okay. Um, One band that I do remember when we were there, who was actually being produced by the guy that was producing us, they were called uh, Mortimer. Okay. This is pre-America by the band America. Right. There were three-piece, great harmony, three acoustic guitars, and they were were great. Mortimer. Yeah, but they weren't... um, Buckley, they weren't uh, Dylan, you know that kind of that kind of thing. So. Yeah, uh, you came back to Pittsburgh in the early seventies, if I understand this correctly, and you formed a band called Sweet Lightning. Yeah, actually, I had never left uh, Pittsburgh uh, other than to do a couple things, but um, okay. Uh, yeah, that band was formed. Um, Bubs McCaig. Yeah. He was the originator of it, and oh, okay. he, he quit the band, I think, after three or four weeks or whatever. So it was uh, myself okay. and Ronnie Foster, Bird Foster, who's uh, passed away since. 
uh, Fred DeLue, Fred Freddie's still around. Mm -hmm. Harry Turner, who's uh, also passed away, he was a bass player. And uh, there was different, you know, it changed personnel over the years. But that band uh, was signed to RCA right. after a couple years. That was a really good band. And this would have been like, would fun. you say, 74? 70? No, I'm going to say uh, probably uh, 70. Okay. 70, 71. Okay. Because we actually did our album in 72, first album. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the band splintered. We had, you know, different guys were replaced and added guys. Sid McGinnis was our guitar and player. That was Sid. Letterman's guitar. Yes. Right? Yeah. Okay. So. The story that I understand to be true is McGinnis referred you to Carly Simon. Yeah, Sid. Is uh, that correct? Yes. Yeah, when Sid left Sweet Light, and it was like you know, everybody was kind of getting into other stuff, whatever. But uh, yeah, he Sid uh, he called me. and He said she's looking for a guitar player, singer. Why don't you send her a tape? Tapes were like what you used to. <laughs> was now is you reel to reel, or was that an actual cassette tape? It was a cassette tape. Okay. Yeah. Okay. But. Um, so yeah, I I was able to get the gig, you know, for that, and it was. Uh, well, was can it? we talk about that a little bit? Sure. Yeah, that I mean, uh, what was she like? What was Carly like? She was fantastic, man. Just <sighs> great, just a great lady, super talented, super nice, and uh, you know, her one thing was uh, she had a problem going on stage after a while anxiety attacks yeah. or whatever and uh, yeah which was a shame because man she always looked great always sounded great mm -hmm. and i mean she'd walk out on stage man people just like she was she was fantastic yeah i mean very beloved just su yeah super nice lady yeah just, and yeah the jane it was the story has it that <clears throat> the james taylor divorce i guess was this was the possible cause of the anxiety issues well I'm not, I'm not sure because james was they had a place in uh martha's vineyard okay at that time okay and the album that we did was called come upstairs mm -hmm. and we rehearsed at their they had a club called the tin roof okay in martha's vineyard and james was around all the time okay you know he, I, I sang with him on the on the when we did the record and he was there when we were rehearsing the whole thing and uh, the song you're so vain was that before that was before but ultimately, did you did you you ended up playing that song on tour with her? Yeah, uh, yeah, because it was like um, it was a hit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. One of the big ones. That one. Uh, just all. I mean, she probably had eight or nine. No doubt. Big records at that time. Come upstairs was her latest album. So we, of course, like bands used to do, you promote it. Was Jagger on that song? Was Mick Jagger on that song? You're so vain. Yeah. I think yeah, I think he's saying a harmony part. Yeah, on I it. always would think that's why the thing came out. Is it about Mick Jagger? Yeah, well, I knew. I that. really don't know who it was about. Yeah, I, I knew that was always the question mark. But the, the the thing was, I you could almost hear in the background that was. It's definitely him. Yeah, yeah. that was him. Yeah. Okay. I, I I never really got independent verification of that, but yeah. Um. So you worked uh, on the come upstairs, and then did you you moved to New York City at that time. I, I was coming back and forth. I okay. Had, uh, family. Um, uh, two young daughters at the time. Right. Uh, yeah. So I would I would go up and work. I'd come home when I could. You know that kind of thing. So it was it was tough. Yeah, I can imagine that's tough. Yeah. And then if we go on the road, I mean, the tours with Carly didn't last. It didn't last that long. Okay. Be because of, in fact, the, it's kind of uh, then implode in Pittsburgh, know, right? Yeah. I'm familiar with that gig to some I was gonna degree. Say well known, but I don't know how many people know. But yeah. I, you know, yeah. 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 It, it was. Um, well, what happened that night? Um, well, you you could see with every show that we did. I think we played in Philadelphia the night before we played in Pittsburgh. Or okay. Played, but anyhow, it got more and more difficult for her to come out and just, you know, come on stage and do it. And when we played Pittsburgh, um, <clears throat> there was a sofa on the on the stage. Okay. And her sister Lucy was with her. And that was like, whoa, wonder what's going on kind of thing, you know. So we sound checked, you know, before the show. And it was like, um, you know, think about, I don't, it's, it's been like 45 years sure, or whatever. But, sure, sure. Um, yeah, it, it was just weird. And then we came out and uh, Lucy came out with her, her sister. 
and people were bringing flowers up and everything, and it was just sure, like, sure, a little weird. But anyhow, so, she said one of the first things she said was, "I'm feeling a little bit nervous." This evening, it could you think maybe some of you people could before it was out of her mouth? It was like there were people up on the stage, like sitting on the stage, you know. Wow, I didn't hear that. And uh, I can't remember if they stayed, I don't think they stayed for the whole thing. I think eventually they filtered back to you know, but uh, the the set was very broken up where you know she'd turn around and say, You know, what do, what do we want to do? I mean, you have a set list of what you're gonna do the show, but it was like it became splintered. But we got through the, the ba- show. The band always appreciates that, right? <laughs> yeah. It was like, I mean, the guys, in the, they were some of the, the best players, you know, uh, incredible band. But, um, I mean, we made it through the show and everything, and then it was like the tour manager, road manager community said, well, guys, tour is over. She's not going out for the second show. And I, Oh, there was two shows. There was two shows, oh. the Stanley Theater. The same day? Like, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah, back to back shows. Okay. okay. So, um, <clears throat> yeah, I I remember going out because uh, my my wife and girls were there and some people I knew. And, it's like, and Rich Angler came up to me and said, "Pete, what the?" F-? <laughs> <laughs> I said, "I don't know, man. I don't know." <laughs> you know, because Rich had booked the thing. I, I said, "I don't know." And the tour ended that. That night. was it. Wow. Yeah, that was the end of it. Wow. Yeah, that I've heard that story for years, multiple people about that gig, and then ironically, here you are, the person that was playing that gig. Well, it's, it's funny because I hear or see people talking about it, it's like that isn't what happened, you know, or whatever. But it's like, oh, of course, the story goes and gets yeah. extrapolated. Yeah. Right? See, I didn't know there was two shots. And then I think to myself, am I remembering this correctly, or <laughs> do I even want to remember it? But yeah, it was it was kind of a heartbreaker because um, it was fun. You know, yeah, but that, that was like uh, that was actually the first thing that I had ever done was like a a big time tour, being with, okay. a, with a band and the whole thing. I mean, the the recording sessions were killer. You know, I walked. I remember walking into the studio and it was like to name drop Steve Gadd's playing drums and Tony Levin's playing bass and Don Grolling. Yeah, so I'm, I'm like, what the hell am I doing here? <laughs> you know, <laughs> so Gad. but. Um, and then the band, I mean, it was uh, Omar Hakim was a drummer, and uh, Mark Egan played bass. Yeah. It was with um, Pat Metheny, uh-huh. and, and it was just, man, some great players. Top-end talent there, yeah. for sure. Yeah, and it was just, to see that, you know, and I felt bad for her more than anything, you know, I was like, well, huh, because you, you don't know what's going on. No, know? and that's her that's her craft. That's her livelihood, yeah. right? She did come back later and did a show. At Martha's Vineyard with uh, with a band, and it was great. I think it was just, you know, recorded, filmed. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. But, of course, she looked great. She sounded great, and, uh, you know. Wow. So can I move on to, is, am I going to pronounce this correctly, is Novo Combo? Right. And if I, if I understand this correctly, when you were in New York, you connected with, um, is it Michael Shreve? Michael Shreve, yeah. yeah. And then you formed Nova with him, correct? Well, no, it was, um, I was ready, after the Carly thing, I was, is it boring to talk about this history, all this history stuff? I'm asking. Oh, okay. Not at all, my friend. This is fantastic. Okay. Trust um, me, trust me. When uh, when Carly's thing broke up, I, I kind of hung around in New York, because, you know, I'd met different people and stuff, see if I could get anything going. <clears throat> and I was, I was ready to come home, come back to Pittsburgh, and... Uh, you know, maybe put a band together, whatever. And this uh, friend of mine, she said, in the Village Voice, Michael Shreve is looking for a uh, guitar player, singer. Once again, I was like, she said, when are you going audition? I, I'm like, uh, I don't know. And you know, I'm thinking that's Michael Shreve. It's pretty, pretty heavy duty, you know. Michael, you know, for people that don't know, he was the young drummer Santana, Santana yeah. Woodstock and stuff yeah. killer player but anyhow so I went to this audition and they had they had auditioned like a lot of guys for you know a while a couple of weeks a month whatever and it was uh, Stephen D's Stephen had played with Hall & Oates mm-hmm. and uh, a few other bands he he actually did a uh, some solo stuff okay and the guitar player was uh, the fellow Jack Griffith Jack was he played with various bands and uh so I went and auditioned, and they, you know, Michael called me. He said, "If you want the gig, man, 
We'd love to have you in the, in the group. So, you know, and it was, it, that was a lot of fun. In fact, we're in the process now because somebody's making money off. We did two albums for mm-hmm. Polygram. Mm-hmm. But somebody's making money off of our stuff, whether it's on... Uh, well, naturally. Streaming it or mm-hmm. eBay, whatever it may be. So it's like, well, who's putting this stuff out? So we found out there was there's a guy who has a kind of record company kind of thing, and he just regurgitates old records. Without and, asking permission? Uh, he didn't ask me. <laughs> and he married, Well, the, the way I found out was he contacted me to see if uh, I had a master of our second album. So I called Stephen, Stephen Dees, and Steve's kind of on top of stuff. So he said, I'll look, I'll look at it, and I'll, I'll find out. I'll talk. And so found out that this guy, he does it with various, well, a bunch of... Uh, yeah. Bands from that era, whatever. And but anyway, we're thinking, geez, if he's making fifty bucks a month, that's fifty bucks a month we 100%. could be making. Yeah, one hundred percent. So it's it's been kind of fun because we reconnected and uh, we have some new stuff that's going to be on it. There's a couple. Oh, really? Of, yeah, videos that were shelved or never seen. We did for like an Italian. So we're going to package, cool. repackage it, and see if uh, you know. Yeah, why not? If all twenty people. Rebuy it. So, Novo played with the Who. Yeah, we opened a bunch of shows for the Who. What was cool about Novo Combo, other than that being a good band, we we got uh, categorized as like a police ripoff kind of band. Okay, not a ripoff, but you guys really sound like the police. Yeah. We we kind of did, but didn't. But um, because of Michael, you know, there was. I remember we were doing. Um, uh, it was our first album, and we were recording. I was in, this, in the studio doing harmony parts, and I walk in, and somebody grabbed me and kissed me on the lips, and it was like, it's freaking Pete Townsend. <laughs> Crushed. But anyhow, <laughs> oh, he's it, great, man. You know, And I'm like, whoa. To uh, just all kind of people, because it was, I mean, Michael at the time was uh, doing percussion on Emotional Rescu- Rescue, the Rolling Stones, Stones album. Yeah. So I remember we were... We had a different name before Novo Combo. Soldier, I think it was. Okay. So we were going to studios, and uh, the guy who was producing us was Chris Kimsey. Chris did From Stones. Yeah, yeah, Stones. The Glimmer, the Glimmer Twins, and Chris. Like that's how they used to produce the Stones. I think. Yeah, is that right? Yeah. So um, I remember walking into uh, a studio. We we're doing demos. To see if we can get a record deal. And I walked in, and it's like. I should say Mick Jagger, <laughs> you know. That's so cool. And Mick, he hung out like you know. No he, shit. Yeah, he'd come to gigs and you know that kind of thing. Bill Wyman. Yeah. I never got to meet Charlie, or Ronnie Wood, or Keith, but Mick and uh, Bill Wyman, they would you know show up at sessions and gigs. You know. Huh. It was cool. I can imagine. Now you also opened for Cheap Trick, right? We toured with them yet, yeah, and. Uh, Greg Lake. Yeah. This was after we had our record deal, of course. We are out trying to, you know, sell records. So. But it's also, if I read correctly, the the 1981 Montreux Jazz Festival. You yeah, played we played as that. Well too. That was, what was about that year? Like, was there was something special about the 81 Jazz Festival? I don't know. It must have been the lineup. It's like when you go back in history and you know, look at that particular festival, they keep pointing to 81 as being... That's interesting. Yeah. Because I remember, the only band I remember being on that, other than, I think Herbie Hancock was there. Uh-huh. Was Al DiMiola there? Do you know? I or think t- Al Di- to I think he might have been there. They had been done by then, I think. Yeah, I think Al Di- DiMiola was there. See, Michael had played in a band with him. With uh, The band was called Go. Wow, I didn't know that. Yeah, and it was... Uh, Never heard of that. Al DiMiola, you should check it out. Yeah. Uh, Steve Winwood. Stomo Yamashita, who's a Japanese how, how did this artist. escape my cranium? Yeah. And uh, God, there's, and Michael. And who else was in that band? One other guy. I can't remember who it was. But yeah. Okay. The only, it's funny, the only act I remember at Montreux was Mink DeVille. Mink DeVille. He was there. A lot of people were like, they were like, I guess the purest, you know, jazz was like, what are you guys doing here? You know, to make the bills here. <laughs> yeah. I know the but whole. That was a th- that was great doing that that whole thing. Kenny Blake and I went on for twenty minutes about what the definition of jazz is and how just, you know, 
it's almost indescribable. There's, yeah. There's so many different pockets and, you know, it you, encompasses you, so much. Yeah. You've seen the Yogi Berra description of, of jazz. You ever no, seen I, uh, oh, you got to check that out. <laughs> it's great. I will, I will do so. It's, it's hilarious. <laughs> Any memories of the touring with Cheap Trek? Uh, really nice guys. Um, that drummer seemed a little strange to me. Ass kicking band. Benny. He, 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 yeah, he, yeah, he'd, he'd always dress with a tie, like a leisure Cigarette. suit or something. <laughs> yeah, he always looked like he, he could die any minute. Yeah. <laughs> he looked like the guy that was working, like, you know, at down at the, the paper company. Yeah. But uh, what a great, you know, and uh, uh, Rick Nielsen, of course, he looked like, uh, what's his name from, uh, uh, was a guy in the old 30s. Uh, was, they were like the uh, little, the Bowery Boys. Oh, uh, Bowery Boys. Whatever it is, you know, with the hat turned up and uh-huh. that, that face and everything. Killer guitar player, you know. Yeah, they were, they were all nice guys. We toured with them for a few months. Yeah, it was it was nice. So this turned pretty big for you here. You turned uh, you actually joined Billy Joel in '84 on the Innocent Man tour. Yeah, and the Bridge tour afterwards. Right, is that correct? Yeah. Okay, so let's talk about this. How did you end up with Billy Joel? Um. <clears throat> Novo Combo had gone through the old management ripoff, you know, hey, guys, we don't have any more money. What, you know, it's like, where is it? You know, <laughs> what happened to it kind of thing. And uh, once again, I was ready to come home. I was just going to bag it. So, okay. In fact, I did. I, I left New York, and it was like, mm, you know, I don't want to do it anymore kind of thing. Or come okay. Home and put a band together or whatever. Okay. And um, I got to be friends with um, when I was in Nova. I did some solo stuff, uh, uh, stuff up in Manhattan, at a few places, and uh, I got to be friends with Mark Rivera, Mark's Billy's sax player. Yep. And um, another good friend, Teddy Leonard, who worked with Novo Combo, is our sound, sound guy and kind of uh, kind of did everything behind the scenes, all that stuff. Um, I got a call from mark and he said would you be into singing uh background parts with billy joel for his new album it's, it's like a lot of singing and stuff i said um okay <laughs> <laughs> don't ask me twice yeah. so it was like you know for me it was like this could be cool it's it's like top top shelf i wasn't a big billy joel fan i like some of his songs but I didn't have to front a band, you know, and it was right. kind of like learn the parts and, you know, sing them and do the whole thing. So, and Billy had seen uh, Novo Combo at a place called My Father's Place in uh, Long Island. Okay. And so, you know, he gave the thumbs up, you know, I went in and did an audition. It was like, yeah, man, you know. So, know you if that album, if I remember correctly, that's when he had like a lot of, it was heavy vocals, almost with like a fifties vibe. Right. Was that correct? Yeah. Well, it was like you could pick the songs like Uptown Girls of Four Seasons and Innocent Man is a Drifters and I mean Billy could do that. He could take a song and it wouldn't it it just like had a a sniff of it. You Got know it. what I mean? But it wasn't like a rip. Got it. That kind of thing, you know. Got it. He was great. You know, like uh, the longest time is the t- the uh, times. Oh, yeah. yeah. As we stroll along, you know, it's like it's it exactly. I remember my my mom and my my pop really loved that record um, because it was like, wow, there's like new '50s music. You know. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. And now it, that uh, was it. The bridge tour that actually took you in '87 to Russia. Yes. The bridge? Uh, that, am I right? The bridge was after. Okay. We did that, that album after we uh, came back from okay. the Soviet Union. So, yeah. wow. So that was a, I didn't know Billy Joel had that much of a gap between the two records. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Well, in between, they released the, uh, or no, that was after, no. The Russian live album came out before the bridge. Got it. So it was like Innocent Man and... So that was the nineteen. It was nineteen eighty seven. That was it was in Leningrad, Moscow, Leningrad. Yeah, and uh, a handful of guys went to Tbilisi in Georgia, which was great. When we got there, um, 
we flew into Moscow, and then I got off the plane and, and went to Tbilisi. Okay. And uh, we met up with... Um, it wasn't everybody involved. I mean, of course, Billy, uh, Mark Rivera was there, Russell Javers, guitar player, Doug Stegmeyer, bass player, Liberty DeVito. And um, we actually went there and met with, it was like nine Russian journalists, Georgian. Yeah, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah. Who, uh, they were singers who did folk stuff from the three, two 300s, 400s, old we went up into the Oral Mountains to a monastery that was up there. The acoustics were like, forget about it. But, you know, and uh, they would do, it was filmed. Uh, I think there's a documentary other than the uh, concert footage. Okay. Shame on me for like, yeah, it's there. But anyway, I know it is. <laughs> but uh, these guys were tremendous. I mean, they were doing all this, you know, and all this really like were they chance chance almost like almost um oh, how could you, how could i describe it um like gregorian in a way yeah 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 but you know and we'd check them out and they'd be doing the, all these harmony things and then we'd go into as we stroll <laughs> you know american doo-wop stuff but the acoustics in the place were I like bet. used to be cool to go to the morgan sing or you know in the bathroom <clears> at the school <throat> whatever but and that it was uh it, that part of the trip was really great because we got to hang with the locals yeah and um we did a, a show an impromptu show at the uh, tbilisi uh opera house that was just by word of mouth and, and the place was packed wow. out and you know we did a handful of tunes, and uh, Billy talked to people through our interpreter. And uh, afterwards, we actually went and had uh, hung out with a family, uh, with musicians, wow. Russian musicians, and uh, it was it was tremendous. Just getting to be experience the uh, locals and everything, you know. I mean, and it's such a uh, groundbreaking thing because the whole world was changing, right? I think that wasn't the whole event scheduled to celebrate Reagan and Gorbachev meeting. Yeah, you know? it was a perestroika glasnost thing, and I, I'm, I think the whole thing was a trade-off. I think the Bolshoi ballet was coming in exchange for Billy Joel going to. Ah, that's what it was. Okay. And Billy's that production was the largest at the time that has ever gone into uh, into Soviet Union. Wow. Put on a show like that. Wow. Uh, Starlight Express on Broadway with Andrew Lloyd Webber. Yeah, that was, um, that came about through, uh, Phil Ramone was okay. Billy's producer for, for years. Um, he was hired to do, to produce the Starlight Express, which was an Andrew Lloyd Webber show. Right. Uh, all done on roller skates, uh -huh. which was crazy. Anyhow, um, Phil asked me, he said, would you be into doing something? I said, absolutely. You know, and I thought of it as, oh man, maybe Broadway. Maybe I'll be on Broadway, you know, <laughs> which never materialized. But, um, yeah, it, I mean, it was it was a great experience. You know, a whole different, other than being in a rock band, you know, kind of thing. Any impressions of uh, Andrew Lloyd Webber? He, he was really different mm -hmm. <laughs> you know <laughs> one of the best lines was liberty liberty was liberty played on you know the sessions and stuff it was a couple guys dave labold from billy's band and uh uh i remember we were doing some song and uh andrew got on the phone and called uh richard stilgo was doing the lyrics at the time okay and richard could you possibly change that line on you know da -da 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 -da, on the phone Ah, oh, cheers, great, okay. <laughs> and then he would explain something about the song. Okay, ta, you know, it was like Liberty said, here's my baby, so it's arms on. It's like no direction. It's, you know, it's like, I don't know. But um, I knew you were going to say it different. I just knew that was going to be the word. He's unique, man. Yeah, I, I, I asked uh, in the late 80s, before I had started working with him, Paul Stanley went up and was the fan of the opera mm. for, the, for the closing of that in Toronto. So here, you know, fast forward 10 years, I'm talking to Paul about that thing and said, hey, I, when I was a fan, I was there watching that. And I asked him, well, what would you think of Andrew Lloyd Webber? 
And he sat there for a second and he said exactly what you said. He goes, different. Yeah. <laughs> and that's all he said. I didn't want to take it any further than that, but. Yeah. yeah but that, I different. mean, there there was some. Uh, just different. Some, yeah, for sure. <laughs> but, it, you know, it was. Uh, then it's like I had the, the part of uh, Rusty. The, the premise of the whole thing was that everybody was a train, all uh-huh. the characters. Uh-huh. Uh, Richie uh, Havens was the father train. He had that voice. You know? Oh, yeah. Um, Mark Cohen, who did uh, mm-hmm. Walking to Memphis. Mm-hmm. Uh, Mark was like song. the... Uh, not, yeah, the steam engine, maybe. Okay. Like the big, you know... Okay. I forget what my... But anyhow, my name was Rusty, and I was like... It was the lead character in the, in the thing. But they they ended up, um, when they put the album out, it was out for a while, and then they had El DeBarge sing a couple of the songs that I had, El had done. El yeah. DeBarge? Yeah. Okay. Just because he was a name at the time. And, right, know. right, but right. But as it, it, as it turned out, it was probably not one of the more successful Andrew Lloyd Webber things. You know, it wasn't huh. Phantom or... But anyhow, I started taking roller skating lessons because it was like, yeah, Get man, I'm going to give this a go. Get out. Yeah, it was dumb. <laughs> <laughs> you didn't hurt yourself, did you? <laughs> no. Just my pride. But um, as, it, as it turned out, they had a problem uh, getting sponsorship to bring it over to, to Manhattan or getting a facility, uh, which was like they had to change it into ramps right. and everything because everything was done on roller right. skates and there were stations where they'd stop and do their thing sing a song, shh, and then they're off and running, almost like roller derby, I guess, in a way. So, so when, you, when you first saw that, and you first were presented the, you know, the music, the script, the score, the, the whole thing, did that? Did it look pretty bizarre to you um, on premise? I didn't think so at the time. Okay. You know, but um, I, was just, I just saw it as a really different opportunity, like something I'd never done or never thought I ever sure. would do. Challenge. Had it been... You just walk out on the stage, you know, and like you learn your lines and that whole thing. I probably, you know, okay, that that may have changed, but it didn't. Anyway, um, the interim was like at that time was it came up. Billy's going to Russia, you know, he's going to tour, go to Russia, and I was like, I'd love to do that. I may never. This opportunity might never happen again, right? You know, which right. I haven't been back since, but. Um, and I, you know, I'd, uh, gotten into doing radio TV commercials, singing, which was, once you're in that, it's lucrative, but certainly I still had that one to be a, you know, rock star kind of thing. So, <laughs> so I opted to do the, uh, yeah, to, closer than most pal. To the tour. <laughs> so, you know, that's what I did. How about, um, Joe Jackson's big world recording? Tremendous. That was so much fun. Um, it was just like a short-lived project. Joe's another guy. Different. Interesting. He's so cool, though, man. He just... I went to see him uh, um, at the Homestead Carnegie oh, yeah. thing yeah. a couple years back. Uh-huh. And uh, oh, he was so good, man. You know, he was doing a new album, and it was just... He was great. Yeah, he, it was, he had that pop hit, like, in, what, early 80s? Uh, yeah, right when the finale was it? Yeah, different for girls and uh, is she really going out with him? And, yeah. yeah, he's he's really an eclectic dude. It bro- and that style of music broke through. I was, it was kind of that was different in its own right. Yeah, stepping out was his big one. You know yeah. that whole thing. But uh, when we did that that record, uh, we got together, learned his songs. It was a small band. It was guitar, bass, and drums. Okay, and Joe. Joe played some accordion. He played piano. Uh, a little bit of sax, and we had uh, four singers. There was myself th- and three other singers, and um, really great, great people. Uh, we would go and play Wilkes Bar in a bar. Just show up, Hoboken, and just show up at these places kind of unannounced. The word would get out, man. It'd be like, that's pretty cool. You know, go to a place and they'd have, you know, the old 7 8 TVs with sports on. Joe was like, shut it off, shut it off. You know, a couple of expl- expletives, but was it an actual scheduled tour? Or he would just show up. Well, I'm sh- the management probably like, like called these places and said, you know, would you like to have Joe Jackson play at your place? You know, kind of thing. And I'm, sh- you know, it was mapped out, but it wasn't like we were going on tour. We were playing like small venues. So the actual recording was done at a Shakespearean studio, 
I think on four, 14th Street, okay. down in the village. Okay. Two track live, live to two track mobile unit. I can't remember. It might have been the Rolling Stones truck at the wow. time. They were notorious for having that thing. But it was mm-hmm. just two track live. We were in a theater, and the uh, the people that came in were handed a piece of paper that said you were actually attending a recording session and a show. Could you please hold your applause till the end of the song? because this is actually a live recording of a live wow. album, but, you know, with an, uh, an audience. So it was kind of cool. Did they we, comply? <laughs> yeah, it was, it was unbelievable. It was great. But it was like, you know, we, we'd get done with a song, and people would wait, and they'd applaud, and then the producer would come on, and he, he might say, uh, Joe, we need to do that song again. Can we do that again? And Joe would say, do you, would you mind if we played those people? And we're like, yeah, you know. Loved it. That's very cool. Yeah. So it was that was a great experience, you know, just doing a session like that. I bet. Yeah. Because, I mean, if you do a – like when we did the Russian show, of course, that was d- documented, recorded, filmed, yeah. you know, Big everything production. Else. Yeah. Huge, huge production. Yeah. Julian Lennon, what do you remember? Uh, that was kind of like a brief session. Um the thing I remember the most is like it was cool singing with him. I'd close my eyes and it was like he had his dad's timber, you know, and his voice and stuff. Uh-huh. But, uh, he was young, really nice, nice kid, you know. I think they tried to at that time make him like a David Cassidy kind of thing. And yeah, and initially on, right? Yeah, I mean his first album was great. Um, once again, Phil Ramone was involved. He was producing it, so Got Phil it. said. You know, come in and do some uh, vocals with Julian. I was like, yeah, I'd love to. Julian Lennon. One of the highlights of that session for me was meeting Cynthia, his mother. Uh, you know, good God, man, it's sin. How are you? <laughs> you know, just a uh, beautiful lady, man. She had this big yellow sunglasses on. And just really beautiful. <laughs> really? Yeah. Yeah. That was that was nice. <laughs> a little piece of history, you know. For sure. Okay, so... Amy Grant, right? And that was in 97? Yeah, that was... Um, uh, we had moved to Nashville for a couple of years. And uh, after... Uh, I was... Billy's last thing I did was in 89. And then uh, I came back home. And uh, I was doing music at churches and stuff like that. And uh, we moved to Nashville in 96, I believe. Okay. And uh, from touring and stuff, I had met a couple people who were affiliated with Amy Grant, Michael W. Smith, and mm-hmm. uh, you know, they were like, "Why don't you move down down here?" You know, and I, I thought, you know, it's not as crazy as New York. You know, my kids were a little older. One of my daughters was already out of school. Um, one was in college at the time, and my youngest one uh, was just starting high school. So I was like, "Hon, you're gonna love it." Brand new high school, it's nice down there, nice house, da da da. And it's like, it didn't fly. <laughs> you know, I always felt guilty that, you know, it took her out of, away from her friends. Yeah, you know? yeah, but yeah. we eventually we came back. and, But anyhow, uh, working with Amy, she's another one that was just fantastic. Right. Just, yeah, just real. She got, she crossed over a bit there. For a minute, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I she had a couple, so. couple big records. And that, that was their big thing. Um, I mean, I was, I, I could have gotten into the Christian rock thing, and then there was doing session demo sessions down there. I had to like mm-hmm. do a pseudo country thing for some stuff, mm-hmm. but there probably uh, was a lot of work, just general work for you. Yeah, right? the thing I found it was really crazy was how clickish it was. Oh, okay. You know, and it was. Uh, I mean, I, I did a couple good things on there, but it wasn't. Yeah. Let me ask this question: When you say clickish, do you mean genre specific clickish, or just like just clicks for clicks personality? Yeah. Yeah, kind of like that. A little bit of both, actually. Okay. You know, uh, with Amy, I I did a uh, actually did one gig with her, and it was it was kind of cool. It was um, uh, comparable to the G seven summit. You know, all the world leaders. Yeah. Were, uh, yeah. It yeah. was. Uh, yeah. Yeltsin and. Uh, uh, it was the Bla- world summit. Tony Maybe world leader. Summit. World leader summit. Yeah. 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 Uh, Tony Blair right. and. Uh, Bill Clinton, you know, mm-hmm. and it was kind of cool. We played. We, it was crazy because we played in this place that was uh, 
it was where they had rodeos and stuff. So, man, it smelled. And it's like, what? <laughs> what? Yeah. But they wanted it to be Americana, you know. Yeah. But it was a great show because it was um, it was kind of the history of American music. And it started with um, uh, a Hopi Indian tribe. Okay. Did uh, okay. a ceremonial dance thing. Then from that, they graduated. They had, like, the Sounds of Blackness. They had uh, the Preservation Band from New Orleans. Right. To Eartha Kitt, to Ronnie Spector, Chuck Damn. Berry. And it was just like, you know, um, Lyle Lovett. Mm-hmm. They had Amy and, uh, you know, some other people. It was, it was pretty cool. Wow. A mixed mash of, uh, you know. Well, it was, it was a historical piece, it sounds like to me, or a historical presentation. Yeah, that's what it was. So you re- reconnected with Billy Joel. I want to say it was the eight, 2008 performance, which was the the last, last show at Shea. Shea. Yeah. That's a big deal. It was. I mean, uh, you know, I had kept in touch with the guys and stuff over the years. But, um, you know, when I got the call to, like, would you be in a, doing the last play at Shea? It's like, nah. <laughs> no. <laughs> I'm busy, you know. But, you know, I mean, that was tremendous. We did one warm-up show at uh, – Just one? Yeah, and at uh, wow. Hershey Park, we did a, a full fledged everything. Okay, I mean, how we, long were rehearsals ahead of time? We, a couple of weeks. Okay, because it's the same songs. Everybody knows the songs, and uh, so the warm up gig was at Hershey. Yeah. Okay. Because there was a big string outdoor, section. Was it was it outdoor? The, it, yeah, foot, the football stadium. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and that was cool. And then we did. Uh, oh my God! I remember it being so hot. Whew. Um, then we did two shows at Shea. Was that Simo? I, I can somehow remember watching that. I thought it was live. Did they broadcast that live? I don't. I don't know. I don't think so. Okay. But um, that was star-studded event. Yeah. It was, I mean, it was. It was Tony. Ben, Tony Bennett was unbelievable. Just fantastic. We did sound check, and it was like kind of like, ooh, I don't know. When he got up on stage. Wow. He was just fantastic. He did he New, York, New York State of Mind with Billy. He just lit it up. I mean, the crowd was just. You're saying the sound check was, was questionable? Yeah. <laughs> so, so was he, what, you think he, he was just holding back? I or? don't know. Who knows? <clears throat> Lyrics. At the time, he's like 80, 86 or something. Yeah, like he that. rose to the occasion. He, you're oh, yeah. Just fantastic. And Roger Daltrey oh, yeah. and John Mayer uh-huh. and, jeez. Uh, um do you get time to spend with any of those guys? Steven Tyler. Just chat, you know. Adultery. That kind of thing, yeah. yeah. You know, I had mentioned, I said, uh, you know, I was in a band with Michael Shreve. We opened for you. He said, Neville Combo. I said, yeah. <laughs> so he remembered. That's cool as yeah. hell. Yeah. And um, Wow. That's cool. Yeah, because that was a bunch of years later. but um, No doubt. Uh, like 30. Don, Don Henley, you know. Yeah, it was 20 years for me since I'd worked with Billy. You know? Yeah. 19 years, actually. I said, I was going to give it 20, man, just to tell you. <laughs> Lose my number. Garth so, Brooks was on that, Bill. Garth Brooks, he, he was fantastic, man. He's he's really a personable guy. Real professional, from yeah. what I understand. And he too. had a Mets shirt on and a Mets hat. You know, he, he knows going, how to work it. Yeah. Yeah, he knows how to work he every city it. he goes in, for sure. Yeah, it was great. Yeah, and, and Don Henley as well, too. Yeah, Don Henley was hey, on memories it. Memories of him. Cause I, I hear, I always hear different things about Don. He's a, he's he doesn't seem like a real friendly guy. No, you know, aloof. Yep. Yeah, yeah, that's always what I've heard too. Yeah, I watched actually watched. And those Billy, are the nicer things I've heard. <laughs> <laughs> Billy did a, an interview with with him that was it was really good about songwriting and the whole thing. But he even then he seemed a little, you know. Aloof, standoffish, yeah. whatever. But I think John Cougar Mellencamp was on there. He was on it. Um, gee, who else? Steven Tyler. Yeah, I mentioned him. And of course, how can we forget Paul McCartney? Paul McCartney. Right? That, that was, was the like, one I want to ask you about. Yeah, man, that that was like because there was scuttlebutt. You know, hey, yeah, McCartney's coming. Uh, you know, second show. It was like really? It was. They had it on the radio, but they weren't saying special guests. But they didn't say Paul McCartney's going to be there. A lot of people really pissed that bought tickets for the first show. You know, I think I kind of I seen him on the second, right? But yeah, man. It was. It was. Uh, so what was that like? That had to be a moment there for you. It was great. You know, I I had come off the stage. Billy was doing, uh, you know, his last song, and uh, I came off, and one of the road guys said, "He's here." I said, "McCartney." He said, "Yeah, man, he just showed up." I was like, "Wow, man!" 
And then his base is tech, base tech, carrying the Holy Grail, you know. Had his base. This guy's dressed to the nines, man. Comes over and you know, he just <laughs> he, he went over over to the tuning station. You know, he's tuning. I said to Mickey, I said, I gotta go over and check this out, man. So I went over. I looked. I leaned over and I put my finger on the base. You know, and the guy's tuning. And he looks at me. He goes, It's all right. <laughs> it was like cool. The list was on it. The song list that he always, you know, real yellow. And then you know, I'm back I'm talking to Mickey, and it's like. Uh, Come walking out of the, and it was like he's kind of looking around, you know, and wave, he waved, come over, walked up to me, gave me a hug, and he says, "How's it going, mate?" You know, I was like, "Jeez, man!" And as, he, as he's approaching, it was like somebody you went to school with, or yeah, something. You know what I mean? Like awesome you haven't seen in a long time. How awesome is that? And it, it was a just genuine. Yeah, it was just a really great moment. You know, I said, "How are you doing?" He said, "I'm ready to rock and roll." You know, and he uh, shook hands with a couple people and put his bass on and went up and. And I bet you, if you encountered him today, he'd probably be exactly the same. Yeah, you know, I just feel bad about him. It's the loudest I ever heard a crowd. New York, loudest ever. Yeah, it was just the place erupted, man, when he he walked out. But it was like, I thought of as, you know, kind of a, not a full circle thing, but kind of in a way, it's like, gee, I had met Ringo before. Mm -hmm. Kind of the same thought, man. If this was thirty four, forty years ago, this has been really killer. But it, I mean, nonetheless, it's. I understand. You know. No, I get it. I get it. And. Uh, and you guys played Let It Be and saw you standing. I saw her standing. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was it was killer. But it's like it was fun. To, you know, there he is right there. I'm singing the harmonies. You know, on, on this song, it was. It was nice. <laughs> I can yeah. imagine it was it nice. Was, it, was. <laughs> it was funny afterwards. We went, you know, to a bar afterwards, you know, the band, a couple of guys in the band and stuff. And they said, do you know him, man? I said, what are you talking about? I said, man, you guys were like, he was like long lost buddies and stuff. I said, seriously? <laughs> <laughs> you could have yeah. played that up for all it was worth. Yeah, man. <laughs> we go, yeah, we go back. <laughs> so. Okay, before we wrap this up, can you talk a little bit about um, – Hewlett and Anderson. Um, we're still gigging around town. Uh, Scott has uh, Scott Anderson and I. We've we've been playing together over twenty years, mm -hmm. you know, different locally, and it's just a lot of fun. I mean, we we've always worked well off of each other, and it's the fun part is you kind of don't have to rehearse or anything. It's like you know this one, yeah, and then we just like make it our own song, whatever mm -hmm. you know. Uh, since uh, COVID and everything, it's kind of. Yeah, you know Scott's got a, uh, a music academy that's, you know he's uh, it's doing well and he's full time with that. So. Okay, so we play a couple places here and there, you know some things in between. But people feel, or when you look out there, does it feel like people are back now that COVID's the past? Um, kind of. I think it's weird. Is like, uh, I mean, the, the couple places that we play, they close up early. It's not like that it seems. Used to I be. hope that's not a trend, but that seems like pretty consistent i think it will be i think it's, i think it's what it's going to be you think i do unfortunately yeah i don't think people stay out like they used to maybe because i'm maybe because i'm old and i don't stay out like i used to but um i don't know maybe with the younger generation you know it'll be uh it's just a different culture everything you know oh it is like if you get down the south side and hang out you gotta worry about Wearing Kevlar and yeah, it's a shame. unfortunately so. It's, it's a shame a, the way things are. It is, you know? yeah. It's um, it's there's uh, this town's always been funny to me. I've always thought that Pittsburgh, as wonderful as the folks are, they really don't appreciate live music. You know, Yinzers don't pay cover charges. Yinzers, you know, have an attitude about it. I I was just sharing this with Norman a couple of months ago when he was on. I said, why is it that? You know they'll fight you on a ten dollar cover charge or even a five dollar cover charge for some of these bands. That the entire band has to split. They'll fight you paying that, but they'll walk in there and think nothing of buying 20, 20 beers over the night and dropping two hundred bucks. Right. Or you know a place an owner won't pay a band, but yet it'll be forty fifty bucks for a dinner. Right. You know is so. that a Pittsburgh thing? You've traveled a lot in your day. Do you um, find that be a unique to Pittsburgh? It might be, um, you know. I I mean, when I think about because I was gone for a long time, you know, back but not in the scene. Um, over the years, there's been so many really good bands, you know, and for whatever reason, Pittsburgh really never mm -hmm. connected. 
like a Seattle, like a mm-hmm. Atlanta, like, you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. And the other thing, you know, discussion talking about, um, you know, what uh, paying cover charges and that sort of thing. Um, a lot of guys still will work for what they made in the 80s or 70s or, you know what I mean? It's like there, there's never been a cost of living increase for musicians like there has for, for the rest of the world. That's a good point. You know, unfortunately. That's a good point. So, um, yeah, that's a very good point. You know, a guy will come in and fix my dishwasher for, you know, what do I owe you? He's there 15, 20 minutes, 200 bucks. Like, huh? You know? Do you think it's maybe Pittsburghers don't really appreciate what goes into live music? Are we such a sports oriented I think so. I think so. There, there's very few places that. Uh, Our music culture isn't as vibrant as a lot of other cities, right? Yeah. And, you know, I mean, it's. I'm not real up on the jazz scene, but I know a lot of the players that are great players, and it's it's always been that way for them too. It's like yeah. you know they're just stuck in a really small place. Mm-hmm. People just don't come to see them, you know that whole thing. And I, I think the fact that there's so many other choices for people, like whether it's I'm going to just stay at home and buy a six pack and stream this movie, or you know what I mean, a lot yeah. of entertainment choices, not yeah, through technology or whatever. Yeah. Whereas, you know, at one time it was like, you got dressed up and went out. Yeah, I mean, and I don't think it was too long ago. I remember the, they did a lot of traveling in the 2000s, uh, big city traveling for the guitar business and meeting a lot of people in the industry. I mean, go to Chicago, it's hopping. It was. Yeah. I mean, no matter where you went. And if you were going to hop from club to club in some of the areas of Chicago, you could expect to drop a hundred bucks easy by going to three or four places because the covers were just part of the gig. Sure. You know, it was yeah. like, it, it, no one was complaining about that. It was just part of the whole culture. Yeah. You know, they, they, it's like they appreciated their, their music. And I, I found the same thing in New York. I, I, I found the same thing in LA in Miami. I found the same thing, but Pittsburgh is a unique in Cleveland, different mentality. Cleveland. I lived in Cleveland for uh, well, funny exactly one year. But, uh, man, that was always a great music town. You know, they used to have uh, the their clubs, the Agoras, yeah, which oh, they yeah. had one in Akron. They had one in yeah. Cleveland, of yeah. course, you know, different Columbus. But it's like, uh, yeah, it was, it was... The attitude's different. Things happened out of out of that, that town. You know, I remember Elton John to Rory Gallagher to David Bowie. You mm-hmm. know, they, they like, kind of happened out of, out of Cleveland, you know. Before I let you go, I just went to the Elton John show. Uh, it's my first Elton John show. I can't believe I'm saying that. For I've been on this earth for so long and love music so much, but I just never made it to an Elton show. And I'm so glad that I did. Snuck up on me. My wife was tugging me. Hey, we have these tickets. We're going, right? Yeah. I said, yeah, okay, we're going. I sat there, and I, I will tell you, there I had moments of tears in my eyes because of what the songs meant to me well, earlier cool. in my life. Yeah. I mean, I, I just, I'm like, why am I crying right now? Because it reminded me. That's cool. Yeah. And that's, I, that's I never cool. had a, I, I was blown away by the performance, Pete, the presentation, the visuals, and just, and the night was beautiful. It was a beautiful night mm-hmm. in PNC Park with the city. Everything was perfect. And he delivered, man. He delivered. That's cool. You know? And I, and I'm used to seeing a lot of, uh, you know, older rock acts now that are delivering with tape and, you know, lip syncing and all that stuff. Yep. I didn't get the sense there was any of that going on. Yeah, that's what I understand. It, it seems so. But uh, do you have any Elton stories at all? I mean, did you, you know, did, did you did you like his music? I always, uh, I've always, oh, yeah. Yeah. I mean, uh, when Scott and I play, we do some Elton stuff, you know, some obscure madman across the water, you know, so many great things like that. His fa- my favorite album of his is uh, Tumbleweed Connection. Okay. And, uh, yeah, man, it's just whew, so many great songs. But, you know, it's like I I would have this stuff happen to me. When uh, him and Billy were doing the the two uh, things, yeah. Uh, yeah. I went down to see Billy and, you know, the guys in the band and stuff. And uh, I was talking to Liberty, DeVito and Billy, and uh, Elton came in. You know, came across out of his trailer and walked over and um, got to meet him. Uh, you know, just eh, whatever. 
But Billy said to me, hey, can you sing Goodbye Yellow Brick Road, that, the high part? I said, yeah, I could do that. He said, can you, could you come up and do that? Because we're trading off songs. I said, jeez. <laughs> <laughs> it's like... So yeah, cool that, that? That was, yeah, it was, it was pretty cool. So you went up there and sang that. Yeah, it was at uh, Three Rivers. You just walked up, you just casually was asked to sing it, and you went up and sang it. Yeah, it was just like you know, you sneak up the back, and there's a microphone and stuff. So, wow, yeah. what a story. So, yeah, that was cool. I've been blessed, man. So, man, you know. there's no doubt, Pete. Yeah, you know, I I can't thank you enough for doing this. This means uh, uh, it means so much to me. Pleasure, man. It really I hope, does. I hope it's not boring, you know. It's like I hate. Oh my gosh, no! Telling not at war all. stories, man. not at all. I uh, I want to thank John Vento for um, thank you, John, for mentioning it to Pete to, to do this. It means it means the world to me, and I'd love to have you back at some point. Would sure, you come man. back again? Yeah, I'd, I'd love to, man. Maybe I, we have panel shows here, and I would love to do a couple of music shows. Maybe have you, John, and someone else a, a third on. Maybe that'd be great. You into that? Good. Yeah. All right, my friend, thank you. And they can reach you. What's the easiest way uh, reaching it out for your schedule for when you're playing out? Is it, is it uh, Instagram? Is it? Yeah, well, we have a website, Hewlett Anderson or Pete and com. Pete and Scott. Yeah. But our gigs are so far and few between. I think we actually put where we're playing for the year. <laughs> so That's all right. That's how, you know. you guys, how they can reach you. Yeah. Thank you, buddy. Yeah, thank you, Eric. All Pleasure, right. Man. All right, friends, we're out. Peace.